God is good. God is good all the time, right? All the time, God is good. Does it always feel, seem like it? To be honest, no, not always. I listen to Tim Keller and others because he's gone to Jesus, so he really knows a lot more now. But he's not talking. <clears throat> but it's curious how when, when I'm a what's called a naive literalist, I believe the Bible as it's written. You know, I am not a brilliant brain. I just believe this is what it is. And, and that's okay. In fact, I think, in me, that's good. I don't have much. People say, well, do, what do you think about this? Well, sometimes I have to think about things that I haven't thought about before. I, where's Jim? I love it, because Jim will come up with a question I never thought about before. And I make up an answer, and then we go on. <laughs> Quite often, there's things I just never thought about. And that's a good thing, to have someone that will challenge you to think about things you never thought about before. Today, I've entitled this The Personal Implications of the Resurrection. I wasn't even going to do it. Then Job, I mean, we had Pastor Don on Easter, just a beautiful, beautiful explanation of the grace of God to us. You know, and uh, what do you do to earn it? Nothing. You just believe. You just believe. And then last week, Joe was talking about the, uh, the coming resurrection. I thought, you know, I guess my Easter sermon is going to come out anyway, so got to do that and he taught us more on the coming resurrection and it is based on the resurrection of jesus so i'm going to look at a few hopeful clues of the resurrection maybe proofs but then i want to focus on the implications of that resurrection for us but before i do that i want to pray and then we'll talk about what the gospel is because we need to have that refreshment in our heart and minds as well so we do come to you father knowing that you're good all the time even though we don't understand it, knowing that you want everyone to come to know you. I'm thinking of my daughter, Sonia, right now, Lord, as she's had surgery and is in a good bit of pain. I just pray that you'd um, reach down and uh, ease some of that pain as well. I'm also, uh, we think of Mark right now, and I just pray that you'd heal him. I pray that, I know there's many others that need uh, prayer and help, and I just pray that you'd watch over them as well. And Lord, soften the hearts of your people. Start with me. But I want a softer heart toward the needs of others and toward the gospel. I want to be more um, in the presentation of that good word that you gave us. And I thank you for your goodness to us today. May we find hope and maybe a little, maybe a little bit of challenge in your word. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 15. Now, now in, in uh, the critics that you read, they're saying, well, these Gospels were written 30, 40 years after. They really didn't know what was going on. The first presentation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was probably 15 years after. It was written by the Apostle Paul. In chapter 15, right, of 1 Corinthians, it talks about this. This is the Gospel, he said, that I preached unto you. How Christ Jesus came down, born a virgin birth, lived a, a, a life, died a death, and was raised. And that's the gospel. Then he goes on to talk about the witnesses that, that were there for the resurrection. Um, the gospel is that we were, humanity was created in the image of God. I think that's important to realize. When God made us, we are a special creation. We're not one of the animals. We're a different breed. He made us and breathed into us the breath of life in a separate way. We had a, a, a life with God, remember? And then when mankind blew it, voted God out, sort of, God's a gentleman. He didn't force his way back in. He just said, okay. But when you bring forth children, in verse five, uh, chapter 5 said, and Adam brought forth a son in his image and in his likeness, spiritually dead. And down through the century, spiritually dead people couldn't bring forth spiritually alive kids. And that's why a couple thousand years ago, there was a baby born. His daddy was definitely spiritually alive. And he just said, in Ephesians, he said, you he has made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. We get, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Romans 5.12 says, therefore, just as through one man death entered into the world and death passed upon all men, because all have sinned, right? And then, but in Christ, we have a restoration of that relationship. It's kind of cool. Back in, uh, our, our teen choir used to sing a song a long time ago, uh, a very long time ago, 
more years than you can even imagine. Well, some of you can imagine because you were old then. But, <laughs> but it was by John w, w. Peterson, and it said this, In the image of God we were made long ago, with a purpose divine here his glory to show. But we failed him one day, and like sheep went astray, thinking not of the cost we his likeness had lost. <laughs> but from eternity God had in mind the work of Calvary the lost to find. From his heaven so broad, Christ came down earth to trod so that men might live again in the image of God. Now that I have believed and my Savior received, now that I from the cry of my guilt am relieved, I will live for my Lord, not for gain or reward, but for love, thinking of what his grace has restored. I'll never comprehend redemption's plan, how Christ could condescend to die for man. Such a Savior I'll praise to the end of my days as I upward, onward trod in the image of God. I can hear the choir singing that. And yes, it was just a sec second there. I got emotional as hard, hard as I am. I, I was thinking about this a couple weeks ago. One of my daily devotionals from a Harvest Ministry came in. And I said, oh, that's perfect. I'm going to read that too. So I'm reading Greg Glory's devotional to you. All right, And it says this, simply, the gospel is the message that God will give us pardon from our sins and eternal life with him in heaven. If we'll turn away from our sins and turn to him, accepting his son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior and Lord. For God so loved the world, he goes on to say, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. This simple message is for all the world. The gospel means we need to face certain truths, doesn't it? Uh, we all stand before God. The Bible says all have sinned. And we fall short of not being good, right? but fall short of the glory of God. See, all that we do is supposed to be for the glory of God. The glory of God. And we fall short of that. In ourselves, we cannot do that. Romans uh, 3.23 says, they all have sinned. We, we, we've messed up. And then Romans 6 says, this, the wages of sin is death. But I love that but God thing, huh? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he shows us the bad news, you're all of sin. Shows us the good news. Yeah, there's a way home. There's a way out. There's no other way to satisfy a righteous, holy demands of God. We could not be good enough to be as good as God, right? We've fallen short of the glory of God. We can't make ourselves alive, uh, only one ever did that. He made other people alive, but only one ever made himself alive. And so that we don't spend eternity separated from God, he made a way for the Son of God to come down from heaven to die on a cross in my place. Kids get that. You teach kids, they get that. Right. Older people sometimes say, well, i got to do this and i got to do this. Stop! Oh, I watched an old preacher the other day, just a clip. You know what he said? He was preaching, he said, just be still! Come to Jesus and just be still. But the guy, what do I got to do? Just be still. Be still. Jesus paid it all, all to him. I owe sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I'm preaching to me. I a lot of times look, tend to look back on what I did wrong. My wife laughs. She remembers things I did right that I didn't even, I don't think I even did. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we'll I have a book that's about this thick, which I'm wading myself through. It's by N.T. Wright. And it's... Uh, the resurrection of Christ. It prevent, presents evidence that demands at least explanation from historians and scientists. And it can't simply be dismissed. He said, insofar as I understand scientific method, when something turns out that doesn't fit the paradigm you're working with, one option is to change the paradigm. We are not to exclude the evidence just because our old paradigm can't account for it, but we are to include it with a new paradigm, a larger whole. A failure to provide a historically plausible alternative explanation for the eyewitness accounts and the revolutionary overnight worldview change of thousands of Jews is not being more scientific, it's being less. So one of the greatest proofs is that those people who ran like scared rabbits when Jesus was taken away within a few days were preaching the gospel. And people said, well, you know, they, they, they lied. They made it. The, I saw a... a what was that? Babylon B, little clip in there. It says, all right, boys, let's get together. It was on the chosen page. Let's get together and make up this lie. All right, yep. And, uh, and by the way, we're going to all suffer death for it, but that's okay. We're going to be persecuted and beaten, yep. But let's make it up anyway. How stupid is that? One of the things that people talked about early on, um, 
is the reality of the empty tomb. All they had to do was go to the tomb and say, here's the body of Jesus, right? Uh, the biblical truth is that the, the tomb was found empty. His disciples um, have been at the center of this Christian proclamation, and they were chickens before. Buck, buck, you know? And I love the fact, I love the fact that when Jesus, if you're going to, during that time, if you're going to write a historical account, all right, I have to tell you this, it's the way it was, you couldn't have a woman testify to it because they were, their testimony wasn't believed. But the first ones who saw him were women. What is that? What is God trying to say? And no, he's not just trying to say value woman because Jesus did that. He's trying to say more than that. We didn't change this that men found it because it was true. It was the truth, and so he left it the way it was, and he did elevate all of us in the faith, that's for sure. Um, all the Gospels that have a uh, describe the circumstances of the resurrection to, to uh, varying degrees of the empty tomb. And there are reasons, I think, to, to believe these reports are historically accurate. You know, a fair-minded investigator couldn't um, help, I guess, but conclude that his tomb was found empty on the morning, and not just from, listen, not just from the disciples, because I'll tell you what, the Jewish leaders said, uh, that, 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 that grave's empty. We're going to find a way to change that. All they had to do was go check it out. It was found empty following the crucifixion. These are just a few things I'm throwing out here, and then we'll get down to the meat of it. The location of Jesus' tomb would have been known to disciples, that or non-disciples and Jesus was buried in the tomb of a very prominent um, member of the Sanhedrin Joseph Arimathea the very group that had orchestrated Jesus' crucifixion right? and a lot of New Testament scholars said well Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea and it is very unlikely that the early Christians would make that story up because just because of the antagonism between those groups um the Jewish leaders, as I said in Matthew 28, 11 through 15, the Jewish leaders were very quick to agree, yeah, it's an empty tomb, we've got to go do something. Look, go tell these guys that the disciples came at night and stole the body, overpowered the Roman guards with a toothbrush, <laughs> whatever. And if anybody says anything, we'll make it right. But they were claiming that those chicken disciples had come and stolen his body away. And by the way, you have to keep in mind that the real, real testament to me is what happened afterwards. What happened afterwards. If the body was still in the tomb, the leaders could have just said, come on, put an end to this once and for all. You know? And it's like they couldn't because it wasn't there. And by the way, the first accounts, as I mentioned before, of the resurrection weren't found in the Gospels. They were found in the Apostle Paul's writings within 15, 20 years of the death of Jesus. He named names, right? He almost invited people. This is a Roman culture. It was easy to travel from place to place. And look, check these people out if you don't believe it. You cannot declare in a public document that these witnesses were here if you're not willing to have it investigated. So that's cool. Uh, if these witnesses didn't exist, he couldn't have made that claim and wouldn't have. I looked up one uh, website. I look up websites a lot. And listen to this. He said, what we learn about the resurrection from Acts 2 will fill out the acronym, Jesus really dead, always the plan, impossible for death to hold him, and Scripture affirms the resurrection. Everybody saw him. Verse 30, 32 said, this Jesus God raised up, and of all that we all witnessed, the disciples all saw the risen Jesus, as did more than 500 other people. Tim Keller wrote, even if you propose the highly unlikely idea that one or two of Jesus' disciples did get the idea that he was raised from the dead on their own, they would never have gotten a movement of other Jews to believe it unless there were multiple, inexplicable, plausible, repeated encounters with Jesus. Tim wrote it inexplicable about this microphone. <laughs> the empty tomb, without the appearance of Jesus to the disciples, just the empty tomb can be explained away. But an empty tomb and Jesus for 40 days repeatedly appearing to people at one time over 500 witnesses that's historically written down in the document that was a public document you, you can't just blame it 
on some over-imaginative people. Some people, I just read one of my readings, I can't remember where, I said, well, those people in those days had a, a worldview that was credible about people being raised from the dead. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They were incredulous. The disciples themselves didn't believe it. We blame th doubting Thomas, but the other ones that didn't believe, when Mary came out, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it because it wasn't in their worldview. <clears throat> um, Tim Keller again. Also, for those who don't believe that the resurrection is possible and it happened, there must be an explanation for all the witnesses of Christ who are willing to testify to others at the cost of their lives about Christ being alive. They were claiming something to be true that would eventually lead many to their death. Blaise Pascal said, I believe those witnesses that get their throats cut. I believe those witnesses that get their throats cut. <clears throat> And there's pages, if you want to look them up, of, of writing to substantiate the facts of the resurrection. I, if you're into real being studious, I've got the book by N.T. Wright. Like I said, it's going to take me two and a half years to get through it, but it's there. But also, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, a very scholarly uh, um, writings that show much, much, much. I liked his whole, I would, and I'm not going to get down the side road, but for the scriptures, the validity of the scriptures. And so that's just a few thoughts on the resurrection, the fact of the resurrection. But really, so what? So what? The verse I read this morning says, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, you might as well go play golf. I can't do that because I stink at golf. Um, it's, that's all of it. I like to watch it. That was fun. Did your guy win? Who did? Finished this today. Oh, today, okay. Somebody call me, let me know. A guy will win. He was in it. A guy will win. Yeah, a guy will win, yes, that's right. <laughs> but so those are just some scattered thoughts. There's tons and tons of writings on this. But what I want to do is go to Romans chapter 6 today. I want us to see, because this is where it really matters, where the rubber meets the road is what does it do to us and do in us and do for us. Implications of the resurrection and the gospel of grace. Now, in order to get a good run, I, I'm, I, if I'm going to go anywhere today, i got a good, good head start before I have to climb the hill. All right. So Romans 5, 1 and 2 starts out, what? Romans 6, you said I did. Listen. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access in, <clears throat> by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Grace. Salvation. No condemnation. Peace with God. In verse 19, it says, For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Also by one man's obedience shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Now keep in mind, this will bear on the, the argument of, of the next chapter. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we come to Romans 6, and the question has been posed is, well, grace is so good. We don't earn this. Can we live any way we want to? And I say, well, sort of. Sort of. But Paul had that question addressed to him, too. Can we just live any way we want to? And I think what he would have said if he, was, if he had uh, been around today was, well, what, what grace does, it says, yeah, you can live any way you want to, but God changes your wanter. He changes your want to. Romans 6, 1, Paul starts out here. What shall we say then to these things, following chapter 5? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul's answer is a strong negative. Uh, King Jim translated it, God forbid, it's a maganeto, may it never become, and it's an emphatic. No, uh, not on your life. Not on your life. And he goes on to show that life generated by those who have been raised with Christ, the implications of this resurrection. He gives here those implications. Not enough to say, I believe, that Jesus Christ raised uh, from the dead is a historical fact. Our lives have to be made alive by the Spirit of God. And then something happens into, in us as we are made part of that family. Remember we say quite often the Bible is revealed propositional truth. Revealed propositional truth. It's meant to be acted on. Not just to sit around and learn about. Richard Berry quite often says that it's nice to know Scripture, but it's more important that we follow it and do what it says. First of all, notice that we're resurrected from the dead to walk in newness. To walk in newness. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says what? Therefore, 
If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. We become more, grow more in him in sanctification. I, I remember, I think it was, we went to this conference down there in New Hampshire. Your wife and my wife and a uh, long time ago. And Gordon McDonald was a speaker. And he's he talking about his family. He bought a camp up in, I think it was in New Hampshire. And it was a big camp lot they were going to build on. And it was covered with rocks. It was covered with rocks. And he said, we went up there the first year. We started moving these big stones out of the way and built a wall. And he said, one of the main crops of New Hampshire is rocks. <laughs> he said, but it's like that in our Christian life. The first thing we go in there is move these big rocks out of the way. And then as we go over the years, we move the smaller rocks and the smaller rocks and the smaller rocks. And that's what God does with us. <clears throat> Immediately he begins to work on the big rocks. Over a period of time, he moves the smaller rocks. Um, rock by rock. And like, we're like those rocky fields. that we, we grow rocks too. But you get the idea. Sanctification is a process by where God makes us really want to live up to what he wants us to live. Um, <clears throat> The Bible says, don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Fornicators or idolaters or adulterers or effeminate or abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says this, and this is 1 Corinthians 6, by the way, 1 Corinthians 6, and such were some of you, but you are sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord and by the Lord Jesus Christ in his spirit. Not what we were. Or not what we were. Thank God. Those who receive Christ in this chapter says that we died with him. When God looks at us now, he says he sees us being crucified with Christ. And then raised, notice, to walk in newness of life. Grace saves us just like we are, but cares enough not to leave us there. That's very important. So we died with him in reference to sin. He died in our place. And Paul spends the next verses showing that we're identified with Christ. We're identified. With, I love that whole idea. We've shared it hundreds of times. And Joe has as well about that ledger book, you know. And on this side is all the glop of me, and on this side is the holiness of Christ. And when I say yes to Jesus, he does a flip-flop, and he takes all the righteousness of Christ and puts it on my page. He takes all the glop of me and puts it on his page. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not fair. I don't want fair. I want what mercy, and I want that grace. So something else we'll notice as an implication, and we're not going to get them all today, but we will walk in newness of life by the Spirit. Sin doesn't have a hold on us. We will sin because we're, we like it. Sin is fun for the most part until later on. But we have a choice now. We have a choice now. We have the strength in us by the Holy Spirit to not live in sin. How do I know? Verse 12. You look right at it. Do not of chapter... I'm sorry, we're back at Romans again. Thank you. I have to be looked after a lot. <laughs> Romans 6, verse 12. said, do not let sin. Do not allow sin. You have a choice. Remember when you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in you and gives you the desire to be holy. Will you always do it? No. Will you always live right? No. But you will want to. You will want to. And yes, you do have the power. <sighs> you have to be committed to the moment by moment living for Jesus. We have a choice by the Holy Spirit. Over in Colossians, I like Colossians. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Colossians, the third chapter. It says, If or since you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. For you're dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life appears, you will also appear with him in glory. So put to death, all right, your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, sake, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you also walked when you lived in them. But now, put off all these, get this, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on a new man who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him, whether it's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, <clears throat> bond or free, but Christ is all in all. Ever wonder what a Scythian was? 
They were mad. They were nasty dudes. Yeah, you guys would like them. They would kill the scythes. You know what a scythe is? What you, yeah, that's what their weapon was like. They'd behead their enemies and drive the skulls and use them for drink out of. Hey. First bone cutlery, yeah, so it was right there. But anyway, <laughs> but when they come to Christ, whether they're living in a mansion or living in a homeless encampment, we're one in him. We are responsible for one another. And then he tells us in, in Colossians again, I'm still in Colossians 3, just letting you know. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you've got to do the same thing. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection or maturity. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, through him. So we have the power, the power to live right. There's a new creation. The old stuff has gone away. Not that old nature. I wished it was. That would be nice. One of these days, that'll get cleaned up when Jesus comes back to straighten up the mess. And we don't do this to gain brownie points with God, to gain merit, but just to fulfill the love of God for others. You, know, you love God, then love others. But I get this. To live above with saints we love, that will be glory. But to dwell below with saints we know is quite another story. <laughs> but we're supposed to do that, and we, and we know it. Um, all right, moving right along here. But, uh, you can stop that pendulum any time. <laughs> I, won't, I won't look. Another thing to note here in verse 8 of Romans chapter 6 again. I'm waiting until my wife finds it. <clears throat> In verse 8, we note that the resurrected dead have a future hope. Job dealt with that extensively last, last time. Um, not only for eternity, but also for now. For now. What was it? The psalmist said, I would have despaired unless I had believed to see the hand of the Lord in the land of the living. For now as well. You, you know, it's pretty nice. You don't have to go to bed feeling guilty at night. Unless you ruminate over things you did in the past, then God will have to correct that too. Where we err is this abound thing has become, unfortunately, an excuse to get it all now. Well, we're supposed to have it all now. Well, no, not all now. God is not a candy man or a physical uh, genie um, in health and wealth. He allows things to happen into our life that will draw us close to him and bring us um, close to him. But we are, as we saw in that Colossians chapter, supposed to set our affections on things above. Be good citizens here, folks. Be involved. Be involved. Vote right I just wrote to my one of my representatives this week. Didn't call him any names either, but anyway. But <clears throat> but serve our king first. Serve our king first. No political party in the world is going to fix things, except when the king comes, and then he's going to have to do it with a rod of iron. So resurrected dead have a future hope. Also, verse 16, memorize that verse. Therefore, the one you yield yourself, servants to obey, his servants you are. Resurrected dead serve the master, their master. No servant in Luke 16 says can serve two masters. You cannot serve uh, God and, and money. Uh, you'll either hate the one or love the other, or love the one and hate the other. And you can't serve both God and mammon, money. You can't. You've got to have your heart set on, I want to serve you. Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. No, it's not wrong to make money. I hope you do. I hope you do. Now, help other people with it too. It's okay to have things, but make sure that your first heart is for the king. A side note here. Soren Kierkegaard was talking about blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He was one of the early existentialists. And he said, purity of heart is to will one thing. I've been pondering on that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Here's another one, and this is what challenged me this week. I kind of rang my chimes a little bit. Resurrected 
dead love the brothers, love the brethren, love the family of God. Like I said, to live above. First Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 22 says this. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unpretended love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Yesterday I saw the power of that love in action. Somebody said, service is love in work clothes. I loved it when two people that came up and came in a little late, they helped me clean up because I couldn't stand up anymore in the last area. You, you know the little girl. She used to fill in Brenda's daughter. Amanda. Yeah. And they came and helped and cleaned up, and it was like the end of it. But what I liked, and what I didn't see this, but Richard noted, was this, this sweet little blonde girl going, now she's an old woman now, I guess, but I don't know, but going down and hugging on homeless, broken people. Boys, oh boys. I've been telling you, that'll get next to you. I want to love the brethren. Service is love and work clothes. I didn't feel like we were um, enabling anybody yesterday. Did give them some food and that but well, enable them. And they got this, they got that. Listen to me. Our job is to help, to reach out, to love, to do what we would want to do in our own living room. Uh, and uh, let God uh, be, be his own witness. You know. I, I guess Guy Dowd was the teacher of the year back in the, what, 90s? Yeah, Ro Rogan, Rogaine. Reagan was president. So this little boy was talking to his grandfather. He said, I, I like the tooth fairy. I put my tooth falls out and he gives us money. Isn't that cool? He's, yep. And he says, Grandpa, if there was a hair fairy, you'd be a millionaire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, um, Guy Dowd was the teacher of the year in this country. And he, and he said, he told a story of when he was in college. <clears throat> and uh, he would go into this certain little cafe to have his breakfast and drink his coffee and eat some donuts and he was also someone who didn't need extra donuts that he would point out. He was not an athlete, not an athlete either uh, at all. But he was sitting in there one day doing his books and study, and this, there was these two people sitting at the bar from, you know, had obvious birth uh, defects, and you could tell by the way they looked, and they were really slow. And didn't think nothing of it, doing this stuff. And all of a sudden, this mom and this little blonde daughter comes walking in. And the woman on the bar turned around and said, How about a kiss, sweetie? He got angry. And the blessed mom, little girl looked at her mom, and her mom said, Yes. She gave up and gave this, what the world would say is ugly woman, a kiss on the cheek and tears coming down the eyes. She said, Thank you. He got so mad. He said, How could she even ask that? And he bracked his stuff up, paid his bill, and stormed out. He said, I walked back into my dorm room, still fuming, and my my roommate had a poster at the head of his bed, and it was a guy laying in the ditch, obviously drunk, and it said, you love Jesus only as much as you love the one you love the least. You get that? It's so true today. Um, I have a book of Puritan prayers, and uh, Puritans get a bad rap. They, they were party animals, you know? John Bunyan was one of those guys, right? And the book I'm reading now is based on, it's uh, called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Orland, but he was uh, writing for the old Puritans who pointed out how Jesus' only description of himself in all of the scriptures is, I am meek and lowly and gentle and lowly in heart. Isn't that cool? But here's this, this prayer that seems to fit here today. And by the way, I've been a bit distracted today for some reason, but that's okay, isn't it? My wife will let me straighten me out when we get home. No, she doesn't use a rolling pin because I can't eat that bread, so anyway. But listen to this, if you will. My Father, enlarge my heart, warm my affections, open my lips, supply words that proclaim love lusters at Calvary, or shines at Calvary. There, grace removes my burden and heaps them on thy Son, made a transgressor, a curse and a sin for me, there the sword of thy justice smote the, the man, thy fellow. There the infinite attributes were magnified and infinite atonement was made. There infinite punishment was due and infinite punishment was endured. Christ was all anguish that I might be all joy. Cast off that I might be brought in. 
trodden down as an enemy, that I might be welcomed as a friend, surrendered to hell's worst, that I may attain heaven's best. Stripped, that I might be clothed. Wounded, that I might be healed. A thirst, that I might drink. Tormented, that I might be comforted. Hate a shame, that I might inherit glory. Entered darkness, that I might have eternal light. My Savior wept, that all tears might be wiped away from my eyes. Grown, that I might have endless song. Endured all pain, that I might have unfading health. Bore a thorny crown, that I might have a glory diadem. Bowed his head, that I might lift up mine. Experienced reproach, that I might receive welcome. Closed his eyes in death, that I might gaze on unclouded brightness. Expired, that I might live forever. O Father, who spared not thine only Son, that thou mightest spare me. All this, transfer thy love, designed and accomplished. Help me to adore thee by lips and life. O oh, that my every breath might be ecstatic praise, my every step buoyant with delight. Satan baffled, defeated, destroyed, sin buried in the ocean of reconciling blood, hell's gates closed, heaven's portals open. Go forth, O conquering God, and show me the cross, mighty to subdue, comfort, and save. Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? It takes a worldview change, doesn't it? God has to do that. Have you been drawn to an understanding that you need Him as your Savior, the Lord of your life? If so, He said, as many as received Him, but then he gave power to become God's kids just by believing on his name. Ask yourself as you go daily and face situations in life, is the power of that resurrection active in your life? You ponder that. Lord, I know it's disjointed today. I hope that you can do something with it. But I do know this, Father. I love you. Um, I don't know all the answers to everything, but I know this. You came. You saw and you conquered. And I thank you for that. Lord, help us to live in light of the love that you have given to us. Lord, help us to live um, victorious in you, um, to be servants of God by serving others, and to set our affection on things above, and not be wrapped up in all the world has to offer. And thank you that we can enjoy all the good things you've given, Father, that you, you want us to do that. But Lord, may we always remember where they came from, and Lord, may we not be reticent to share with others. So I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and as Elmer Fudd said, da -da 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 -da. yeah. Oops, I had to shut that off first.